And we're live. Welcome to the big show. That was the best announcer voice that I've got, folks. And it was pretty damn good. Whoo, on that note, I want to say welcome to Yawa. This is episode 75. Um, kind of have a fun topic for everybody this evening. I'm trying to figure out this sizing thing. What the heck's going on with this? That's not doing it. No, it's not helping. Come on now. Nope. You just made it really small there, didn't it? Hmm. Uh, undo. I can't undo. Command That's Z. not a thing here. What the heck? Add. Preview scaling? There you go. I don't know if that helps. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, guess what, folks? We're here. It's Yawa night. We're having a good time. I hope you're having a good time. And we're playing with technology and... Gotta love technology. Oh, absolutely. Um, but I want to see a few check-ins here. And while we're rolling into that, let's go that way. Oh, yeah. A few people tuning in. Thanks for tuning in with us, guys. Um, and, haha, some of their fighting over telling me to hit, hit the record. record button. I already told him. Oh, yeah. Recording now. Let's see. We don't need that. Goodbye. Um, I want to start with just a quick thing. This is something that gets brought up every time, and it's because it's important. Um, patrons, those of you that are patrons, I want to say thank you right now. And anybody that is watching that is, um, not a patron also should be saying thank you to patrons. They're the biggest sponsor of what we have going on here. And all of that being said, um, without them, most of this would be drastically less possible. Okay. I'm going to say we could sp still probably do a little bit, but drastically less possible. Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Patreon's a separate community. It's an online dog training community. That's how we have it set up anyhow. Um, it's there for you to be able to ask us questions. We've got lots of videos out. Those videos are free, available to you on YouTube. Um, we have a new series, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but... All of the free content, people are like, you do so much free content. Well, we do, but uh, it's all funded for by patrons. So if you like what we're doing, uh, want to join in there, it's patreon.com slash standing stone kennels. We would love to see you there. And that's where the, the nitty gritty comes in. If you have questions, if your puppy is not looking or doing exactly like what you see our puppies do, um, we can answer your questions. That's, uh, we can help you get right back on track and guide you through that training process, answer your questions and even evaluate training sessions, whether that's by you sharing videos to us or setting up actual live videos where we are watching your training session happen as it happens so that we can have very timely critiques to what you're doing. Yeah, the most powerful thing that Kat and I have to offer all of you is not those training videos that we put out. But in fact, our ability to read uh, dogs, dog training situations, and how to direct you down the path of righteousness. No, but close. We'll direct you down the path that rocks. Okay. Okay. Um, some, some movie. I think uh, Emperor's New Groove, actually. <laughs> the two little devils. He's got the angel and the devil. It's Kronk, right? No? Mm -hmm. you never seen this? I've seen this. Come yes. on oh, now. Come on now. So, um, all of that being said, thank you, patrons. If uh, you're here, we want to say thank you. Now, speaking of patrons, what we got, Kat? So, one of our patrons sent us uh, a couple hunting bird hunting planner and journal uh, I'm going to see if I can put that a little closer so you can see mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. probably blurry. I don't know. It's usually blurry. But uh, it's really cool. So I wanted to say thank you for thinking of us and sending us this. Um, she sent us a couple. This is from Nicolette. And um, she sent us a few of these, which we plan on using. Uh, Ethan especially. Um, he's going to try and do one all for South Dakota next year. But inside of it, there's a planner 
and a journal page, and you get to plan out, you know, where you're going to be hunting, the dates, um, who's going with you, some pertinent information, and then kind of a journal part of how it went, um, what birds you harvested, things like that. And then there's another place where you can actually take just some notes and journal about it. And I thought, this is a really cool idea. Um, this is a book that she created. Um, but that's a really cool idea for longevity, too. So Aiden can look back at, because he's already asking for hunting stories. He's like, tell me a South Dakota secret. <laughs> and I'm like, well... They're South Dakota stories, honey, but uh, he loves hearing about the roosters going, ar, 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 and he does the same thing. So he asks for those hunting stories a lot. And so if we have them written down and journaled, uh, he'll be able to look back on those stories. And I think that's a really cool thing that he's going to be able to do. And us when we start to, you know, memories fade. Oh, 100%. Let's see... There did we you, go. Did you fix it? I think so. Mm, we'll see. No, not quite. Oh, come on now. <laughs> anyway. So while Ethan's still messing with technology, guys, he had mentioned we have a new series coming out on YouTube, something that we're excited about. We are going to be talking about, well, first, I guess we should probably announce Ooh, do it, do it, do it, do it. The do it. newest member of the Standing Stone squad, pack, as you will, is our newest puppy, Clay, from the Muddy Rooster Litter. His name is actually going to be registered as Standing Stones Molded from Mud, since he's out of Muddy. And we're going to keep his puppy name, that was Clay, as his call name. Uh, we got to play with him a little bit today with some wing on a string, you know, that sort of thing, get some cool pointing pictures, and now we're going to break that fishing pole in half. Well, actually not because we use that pretty much every puppy, but we're not going to use it with him anymore, and it's interesting. We were taking the pictures, and we got quite a few, like, boom, 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 really great points and really good interaction, and then you could see his interest kind of fading, and he was getting like, well, what is going on with this? And that, just reading his body language with how he's reacting to that wing was a good indication that, hey, we know that we've done enough to know that we've done enough. What is that saying? And we've done enough to know that we've done, we've done Gone. enough to know that we've, we've done enough. What's that saying? I don't know. know. Basically, we were like, okay, this is an indication that we don't need to be trying to do this anymore with him. We've got the pictures we need. Put that away. Don't mess with it anymore because he wasn't reacting the way we wanted to see anymore yeah, exactly. um, with that wing on a string. But the cool new training series that we're going to be doing is um, the start of what you guys all have been basically waiting for, asking for, begging for, and I've been promising, we've been promising that we're going to do for a very long time that just keeps getting pushed, pushed, pushed. Um, we're busy, lots of time invested. A all-inclusive, comprehensive, step-by-step, lesson-by-lesson training video series. Now, we already have playlists, but people get lost in those playlists, we've heard. Oh, so, yeah. Um, you know, the biggest thing is that we are trying to give you something more step-by-step -step to follow. We're going to do this with Clay to the best of our ability. We've got lots of series that show all the steps, but they kind of jump between series because, uh, let's face it, folks, it's difficult to get all of the things at, with one puppy, but as much as it's difficult to get all of the things, it is also every puppy is different. So there are going to be some things that he will do better than others, some things that will need more training, and your puppy may not follow this plan exactly, but it is essentially as close as we can get it, the steps that we will take with every puppy. Yeah, and that's going to be, like I said, what we've been trying to create and have for a very long time. It's going to be very thought out, step-by-step, um, -step, outlined, bullet points, all the things. And then again, it's going to very much go hand in hand with our Patreon community. So you can follow that. But then when you have questions or your puppy isn't doing everything exactly like Clay or he, they're doing things faster than what Clay's videos are, you know, showing, then you can reach out and ask questions, get check-ins, you know, hey, is my puppy doing this right? Is he ready for the next step? And we can give you that um, feedback so that you can continue training your puppy in the kind of 
process and path that we've laid out. 100%. Now, this is something that we jumped past as Ethan was screwing around with technology. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at these check-ins real quick. We've got uh, California with a reminder. About the record button. It's recording. Dawn and Melanie and Duncan checking in. Heck Minnesota. Yeah. And we've got Kelly, Mac, and Jax from New Jersey. Hey. Hey, uh, hey Cruz from Texas. Waxahatchee. Maybe. Waxahatchee. We've got cool. uh, John Kennedy. Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey. Oh, it jumped. It jumped. jumped. I saw Rhode Island, Minnesota again in there. Whoa, Lordy, it jumped. Oh, we're lost. There we are. Okay. There so it is. when yeah, more yeah. comments pop up, it like Jumps pulls the all bottom. the way to the bottom. Yeah, so fine. we're no, trying we'll to scroll. Georgia. Hey, we're going to be talking about Georgia a little bit today. A little bit. South Dakota, Hi. California, Oregon. Hey, Jill. Um, Southwest <laughs> Ohio. Hit I hit record already. We got, hey, Angelo from New York. We'll be seeing you guys soon. Absolutely. Chicago, Horace, Kansas. Oh, yeah. Hey, John. Tech difficulties. Yeah, just a little, but. Colorado, Baton Rouge. That's awesome. Uh, we appreciate your patronage, everybody. Thank you, patrons. Absolutely, folks. North, North Carolina, Carolina. Minnesota. Rhode Island. Gun Lake, Michigan. South Dakota. Mass. Massachusetts, yep. Uh-huh. We got a lot of check-ins, guys. That's awesome. Having some Woodford Reserve bourbon. Woodford Reserve is fantastic. We're, we're Definitely Emperor's gro New Groove. Yeah. Heck yeah. You knew it. Uh, <laughs> That's a pretty crucial conjunction. I was just thinking about that. That's solid mahogany. <laughs> I can't break that door down. Did you like memorize the movie? I mean, we watched it quite a few times. I mean, it have you watched it one. recently with Aiden or something? Um, because I mean, it's been a minute since I've seen squeak, it. Squeak, squeaker, squeak, squeak. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, All the great I haven't quotes. Seen it in a long All time. the great quotes. Montana. Okay, it jumped again. Indiana, Jumping. Fort Worth. Oklahoma, New Mexico. You're all over the place, guys. We love it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We got another Ohio there, and I think we are there. Now, I saw something a second ago. Now it won't go. Oh. There it is. Now, we already got one super chat come through, and I wanted to mention to everybody, um, we're going to do a little chit-chatting about the teaser topic that we threw up there in the title and in the description. And then once we get through that, we will roll right into answering questions. Uh, because you guys do super chats, we really appreciate that. We actually take monetization off for watching live. So you get to watch this with us ad free and then we will prioritize super chats first and then answer any other questions we've got until we run out of time. Yes. Okay. Because if this is your first time tuning in and you don't know what YAWA stands for, it stands for you ask, we answer. And it literally was kind of a joke when we started this. I'm like, I don't know. What should we call it? YAWA, you ask, we answer. And I'm like, well, that's a stupid name. It's never going to stick. Here we are. Here we are. Episode 75. It's still Yawa, and I'm pretty sure it's not going to change. <laughs> Insider scoop for y'all. Uh, StandingStoneSupply.com, which is our training supply store, everything that we use and recommend that we can get currently, and we're always trying to add to that, um, is available there. StandingStoneSupply.com. We do have a last-minute Christmas shopping sale. It will be the 14th and 15th of December. So next we'll send week. out a newsletter blast about that. If you're not signed up on the newsletter, you can do that at our website, either standingstonekennels.com or standingstonesupply.com. We'll have 20% off all Standing Stone um, stuff. And then like Easy Leads, like easy Black leads. Collars, We got uh, steady two tabs. new colors of Easy Leads, purple and green, uh, brand new. Yeah, we'll be... Doing some promo pictures of that stuff soon. Absolutely. And then uh, I'm going to do my best to throw in 15% off most of the rest of the store. And it'll there be, may be a few exclusions. but be a few things. But um, all of that being said, we do have, uh, you know, kind of a new grooming line. We just added a bunch of new products, things that we've been trying to get a good place to get 
them from for a while, but all the stuff that we utilize to take care of our dogs and the dogs here at the kennel, um, we've added those things as well as um, we should They're not have live on the store yet. It takes time to get pictures and things posted, but very soon. Very soon. By the time by of the, the sale. sale. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, we will also have or should have uh, med kits back in stock by then. At least a handful of them. Supply, demand, that stuff is is a problem everywhere. And yes. that's the biggest thing that's holding us up. But we should have those back in. So, you know. And then um, our goal is, quote unquote, guaranteed by Christmas. We don't have a money, ga- uh, money back promise or anything like that. But if you've got orders in at that sale and you utilize FedEx, um, there should be no issues with you getting it. Uh, most of the we, stuff that we do is FedEx yeah. home delivery, or we do have uh, FedEx two-day shipping that should be pretty dang quick. Yeah, because we're really fast about getting orders out, like, next day. Um, even over our Black Friday sale, people were saying, hey, I ordered stuff from you, and it was getting here faster than Amazon delivery, so that's really cool, um, and we really push to do that. But again, things get held up with the mail delivery systems. Literally, I ordered a dress a couple weeks ago that was supposed to be here for our holiday party last night. It showed up today. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. So. And by the way, you look fantastic and you tried mm-hmm. it on. Ooh, Thanks. Baby. That just means mm. you have to take me out for dinner another time. Uh, 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 uh. Twist. Oh, I didn't even have to twist your arm. So uh, last but not least, uh, usually this is the place that we announce things to first. We have used equipment. Okay. We have two, three dog systems. They are not being broke up. They will be sold as a three dog unit. They are MR 1100s. We have two of them. We have one that has camo transmitter with three camo collars that have different colored straps. MR 1100 again. And then we have a black unit. Same scenario if you are interested email us at contact at standingstonekennels.com put that in there contact at standingstonekennels.com that's if you are interested in the used unit um, units there are two of them we'll go in order of the emails that come in usually this equipment sells pretty quickly just shoot us an email i'll get you a price it's going to be absolutely fantastic you will not be able to beat it that is my promise to you. How do you ha, pin ha, it to ha, the ha, top ha, or whatever? I'll show you. Okay. Zoop. I knew it wasn't zoomed in. or it was Zoop. Yeah, I knew something. Zoop. I knew something. That's no doubt, babe. So, without uh, any, any other magicness that we need to talk about, I think it's time to get right into the nitty-gritty of this evening. Okay, so um, we have... The topic of the day. Um, that is uh, hunting <laughs> preserves. Yeah. Are and they helping? Are they hurting you? And why? And I would say that there's definitely two camps out there about hunting preserves. People that have opinions have pretty strong opinions one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, there are the wild bird purists that... Ah, uh, preserves. <laughs> Yeah, they I don't know why I'm making all kinds of stupid accents tonight, but I don't. I'm either. pretty sure I'm not done yet. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but they think that preserve hunting is not as prestigious as wild bird hunting or something. Oh, yeah. I had a conversation with a guy just the other day. He's like, well, I get the opportunity to hunt some wild birds, and then we go to the preserve. And, I know you get to hunt wild birds. You're probably thinking, bah, preserves, what a horrible thing. Which is not the case at all, but um, you know it's a, it's it's out there enough. It's a it's enough of a thought process from folks that someone would follow with a um, caveat that it's oh I know preserves suck right or they think or they think that you think that yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. and so we wanted to talk about the the differences between preserve hunting, wild bird hunting, and pros and cons of both a little bit. So, uh, first and foremost, I, we do not hunt preserves very often. If you want to consider us a quote unquote preserve, we shoot training birds in training. Um, but even that is slightly more canned in a, in a majority of situations. Unknown um, caller. Oh, come on now. I didn't do not disturb us. Goodbye. <sighs> 
Um, Call you back later. Maybe. Uh, the lost my train of thought. Sorry. We have more. We of don't tra- do it very often, and That's we have more of a doing. training situation with liberated birds, set birds. And that's not quite the same as like a preserve hunt situation. Yeah, either, it's so. not yet, even because uh, we are placing birds in specific places and expecting them to be right there. Um, it's one of those deals that you uh, you need the scenario to be set up right to be able to help the dog develop properly and in a relatively quickly manner, a quick manner. Excuse me, but. If so that they can get reps in. I mean, yeah, training reps. involves repetition um, of learning the skills that they are here to learn. And if we can't repli- replicate that consistently enough, it's going to take them a really long time to learn those skills. It's no different than any sporting activity that you've ever participated in. You don't just play basketball at the game or you don't just play baseball or whatever the sport. You, know, you don't just go to games. You have practice, right? And in practice, you work on fundamentals. So you stand in one place and shoot uh, working on your flick of the wrist or you do whatever it may be to work on fundamentals to be able to better yourself for the the game. But um, all of that being said, I got the opportunity, and we talked a little bit about this last time, but to go to and hunt a preserve. It's a fun opportunity. And... It was something that with the recent conversations that were timely in the fact that I had just been recently, I thought this was a good um, topic of conversation for this week. Now, first and foremost, I would say that preserves in the right dosage, handled the right way with the right things, um, are a good thing. They're not a bad thing at all. Uh, The biggest thing that I can warn you about is anything a dog is doing, they're conditioning themselves to. So stupid, crappy birds are going to make stupid, crappy bird dogs. (laughs) That's it. I mean, uh, no ifs, ands, or buts. But that doesn't mean that all preserves are created equal and that all preserves are going to have poor quality birds. You, You need to look at the preserves and the difference in quality of birds as well as quality of habitat. And those differences um, are going to make or break that situation. So you get good quality birds that are wild-like, that the dogs, if they try and overpressure them, are going to flush wild so that the Mm -hmm. dogs can't run in and catch them, um, that act a little more birdie a little more wild like like you were down there and you saw that covey of quail that flushed very wild like yeah i mean they were as wild as you can get birds i would assume that they were supplemented and then surviving on their own at that point but it was a big wild covey i mean the dogs didn't even hardly get it pinned down and us be able to work in before it took off that happens at quality preserves you have residual birds those birds become more wild-like in order to survive. Especially if they have quality habitat to maintain those numbers of birds. Yep, 100%. Now, uh, when I was down there hunting quail, it was um, it was a good time, okay? The majority of the birds, I would say, allowed for a little more pressure than wild birds would. But at the same time, once they got up, they flew well which is, is an important part of things. And that pressure being the key factor here. So I was saying crappy birds make crappy bird dogs. Well, if your main goal is only to hunt preserves, it doesn't really matter. You're, you're going to go, you're going to do that, and it's fine. If you have the goal of even taking one or two trips a year um, to go hunt wild birds, if you want to be successful with your dog in that situation, they need to be better prepared because – Wild birds don't put up with the crap. They're not gonna. They're not gonna stand for being overpressured. They're not gonna stand for being um, disrespected, if you will, by the dogs. You know, it's, it just takes a different level of handle, a different level of steadiness, and um, preserve birds don't. You know, they a lot of times can be overpressured, and that's where you see dogs that creep all the way in where their noses are basically touching the bird and then you come in and you scoop it out with your shoe. That's like the epitome of the worst type of preserve. So um, 
trying to find a place that's not like that is going to really benefit you. Now, on the flip side, um, I think that there's uh, some mental blocks for people that go to preserves. And I don't know if you've ever seen this or, or heard or... Yeah, people are like, well, they put out 25 birds. I need to find all 25 or my dog did poorly. Well... Or something. Yeah, that's, exactly. And that is something that people say to me all the time. Oh, we put out we put out 20 birds and they found all 20 or they only found, you know, 18 of them or whatever the numbers are. And to me, yeah, I want the dog to find birds. But if those birds are truly put out in a more natural situation, uh, there's a chance that some of them are going to run off. Some of them aren't going to be exactly where they were planted, which is going to set up a more wild-like situation, a more natural situation for the dogs to hunt, to search, to be purposeful, and find the birds on their own. Um, So I wouldn't rate success necessarily based on, you know, 100% of the birds were found or 50% of the birds were found. That doesn't mean that your dog did poorly or that you had a bad hunt. That means that the dog had to work for it and not all those birds were there, which means they're probably really good birds. Yeah, and I I would say on average, 50% would be the number I would shoot for to say you had a really good day Um, and you may find some extra and there are going to be some days where you do, but ideally, um, there's there's one place in Iowa. So we've talked about this a little bit. We do a, a hunt called Cabin Fever, and this is one place that we go to a preserve every year. And it's just a fun end like, of the year end of the hunt. year deal. A buddy guides out there, and he invited us out. And I've gone a few times. We've won a few times. We've not won for almost more than we've won times now. But I haven't gone the last couple of years, so that's you know. the problem. You know, I, I mean, just look at her. I, it's just <laughs> enough said. So she's a valuable part of the team. I'm just saying right there. The, um, and the year that she did come, we took second, second, and you get these cute bird little houses. cabin birdhouse things. Mm-hmm. They're super cool. Um, but I digress. That preserve is a little bit different. They have quality habitat set up, um, grass, food plots, and depending on the amount of weather and stuff throughout the winter, some of them hold up better than others. But a majority of their birds kind of get flown out or dumped out of the boxes. Like these birds are going in the general or they set the box down, let the birds walk out. Um, That kind of setting is going to be drastically better for the hunting experience. And, um, you know, and it's not as hard on the birds either, which then they, yeah, you know, then like absolutely. spinning them, dizzying them and putting them in this one spot that they're going to stay there forever and ever until you get on them. So when you are in that situation or if you have the opportunity, it's a smaller quote unquote mom and pop shop, right? There's a few of those around. Um, ask them just, Hey, just fly them out, dump them out, let them go. We're going to work at this and plan on hunting our full three days or, or three hours, excuse me, or our full all day if you have the opportunity for that and go hunt cover that birds would move to. Go look for them and not just walk from one station to the next kicking birds up in the air. Walk down this strip, this food plot strip that that's where all the birds are going to be. Yep. That that's where they're all planted. And, and that's going to help prepare your dog, like I was talking before, to have a better chance when it comes to wild birds. That's the ticket there. And that's something else that I wanted to mention. So not only um, is it preparing the dog for real wild-like situations, but I think that there's a lot of people that um, get into hunting, get into bird dogs, they get their first dog, it goes through a training program, and then they're like, well, now I'm going to go hunting. Well, a preserve, the right preserve, can be a very valuable middle ground, too, between getting your dog trained, your first dog that you may not have any or very minimal hunting experience yourself and hitting the wild west and going to South Dakota or Idaho and going, I'm going to try and figure it out as I go. Um, so you can gain a lot of, um, a lot of good things at the preserve as a person as well. You can gain confidence handling your dog in a little more controlled situation where there is a little more guarantee that there's going to be birds because there's been times we've walked and walked and walked in Kansas, in South Dakota, and we've seen no birds. Well, I know that gets discouraging for me. 
it also gets very discouraging for those young dogs or they get bored and they start mousing or start just chasing chichi birds. You know, they need to have enough bird contacts that they stay focused and they go, oh, this is my purpose out here. I can truly apply what I just learned in training and practice to a more real like situation, but it's still going to be successful. Oh, 100%. And like Kat was saying, I think it was uh, maybe last year, December time frame. Um, I said, I'm going to shoot a uh, little video of uh, a catch it was two clean. Years ago. Okay, two years ago. I'm going to shoot a video, catch, clean, cook, right? I'm just going to go out. All I got to do is kill one pheasant or a quail or something. It'll be fine because we do have wild birds here. And I know a few spots that are typically better than others. Well, I hunted four hours and did not move a pheasant or quail. Nothing. Didn't see one. Not even a hen. Nothing at all. And when you have a young dog, now at that point in time, I had seasoned dogs. They ran and they get tired. And even seasoned dogs can move away from uh, the task at hand if they've, uh, you know, been deprived long enough of contacts. And they start hunting something else, trying to. And that's where you see a little bit of mousing or you see um, some form of off game or they start pointing, you know, songbirds in the trees and bushes and grass or chasing whatever, or just screwing around. Like they'll come over and walk next to you. Like, I don't know what we're doing out here anymore, dad. It's just as ridiculous. And um, you know, when you start to see those things too, you know, you've gone too far the other way, but unfortunately it's the world that we live in we can't especially with wild birds you can't 100 percent predict that yeah and so that preserve can supplement that especially with a young dog that needs the practice in a little more wild-esque um true hunting scenario so it's able to gain those young dogs some experience some guaranteed experience if you will um, and that's why, so we have a good friend that Ethan was mentioning guides out in Iowa where we go to this cabin fever hunt all the time. And we send a bunch of our young dogs, um, with him to guide in the late season stuff because they see a lot of birds and they're good quality birds. And those young dogs gain even more experience than, um, they would get here hunting wild birds around, around Kansas after Ethan finishes guiding with them in South Dakota. So they, you know, get a month of guiding season under their belt on wild birds in South Dakota. Then they get to go rep more of that um, in a very wild-like situation, even though it's a preserve. And that's actually where Splash, Trix, Hazel, and Puppy Shock are at right now until the end of the preserve season, gaining a ton more experience and exposure on birds so that they'll be ready to move into some more advanced training um, yeah, a, the off season in his groups there specifically. I mean, as far as talking about exposure, they may shoot five or six hundred birds before the end of the season. Um, which birds is a make lot. a bird dog, and especially if they're good birds. Those dogs are going to be divided out fairly equally as being half on the ground. So I mean, each dog is getting a uh, hundred and fifty birds approximately over the next few months. That's a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot of birds. Definitely. So. Like I said, those young dogs gain a lot of experience, and then people can gain experience and confidence handling their dogs. Um, If you're new to hunting and you're trying to figure things out, it helps you go, hey, this is where we're finding the birds. So you start making those connections of where actual good bird cover would be so that when you go out wild bird hunting and you're looking at areas, you're not just walking to walk, you're walking intelligently trying to work cover and areas that there could and should be the potential for wild birds. Um, And then some of these preserves actually have guides. Um, You may go out and have a guided hunt, which those guides can actually help you as well, gain some um, mentorship, I guess, from them, you know, how they're handling dogs. Um, You might learn some bad things too. (laughs) It can go both ways, bad birds, bad guides, good birds, good guides. Um, but they may be able to, you know, give you a little bit of experience as well when it comes to gaining knowledge if you're new to hunting. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of benefits to it. And I, I saw a couple comments coming through here too. Some folks are like, well, that's all we have the opportunity to hunt. And I hear me and Kat here saying, we are not knocking preserves at all. Like, it is commonly assumed that we would because we talk about going to hunt 
wild birds here in the state. Um, we've shown some videos or photos on that. We've talked about going to hunt wild birds in Nebraska, South Dakota, Wyoming, Texas, Texas, Iowa, Iowa, um, Montana, North Dakota, uh, Michigan, North Dakota. We've been around, done a fair amount, and all of that being said, um, I'm still open to the opportunity of you know a hunt like that if it if it comes up. And we have we're lucky enough to have enough um, opportunities on average that we don't need to, but. If that's what you've got, go for it. If that's what you've got, go for it. But take a slightly different approach to it, okay? Utilize it as training for your dog. Um, understand that those birds are not as wild. So take the time, help your dog stand steady, and don't develop a bunch of naughty habits that eventually turn your dog uh, in more into a little monster, uh, basically, that has no respect for birds and doesn't listen and doesn't do things right. So... Yes, definitely. I mean, like we started this conversation, anything your dog's doing consistently, they're conditioning themselves to. So if you're not handling them and just letting them run willy nilly, doing their own thing, doing naughty things, that's what they're going to be learning from those hunting situations, whether it's a preserve hunt or a wild bird hunt. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't well, know if we've got anything else on this topic. Did you have any other notes? We took we tried to take some notes ahead of time. Uh, no, I think we covered all of it. Okay. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. The, the do's, the don'ts. Is it helping? Is it hurting? The answer is, if you're doing it right, it's a good thing. And if that's the option you got, go for it. Just, just find a good and, place to yeah, do just it. Just try and change the you know more typical path in which those hunts happen, and you'll be happier. So. Now, I saw some Super Chats in here. I want to roll back up and touch on those first. Looks like I see there. one here. Perfect. Go for it. So, from Kelly, uh, thoughts about dual champ for dogs that you don't plan on breeding. In addition to Navda, what would you do for a GSP? Um, I guess, so if you don't plan on breeding, um, I, I don't know why that affects the answer. Um, it, it affects the answer because it's a cost effect. It's not a cost effective venture. Okay. So titling and trialing and testing and traveling. True. It's an expense. It's expense. Now, but granted, if it's something that you, in- it's a hobby. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's something you enjoy doing with I, your dog. I blow and- a lot of money on stupid hobbies. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Pigeon. So maybe come on now. Color me. Tell me, yeah, exactly. That I, I resemble that remark. Yeah, so um, just because it could be uh, an expensive hobby doesn't mean that it doesn't have an enjoyment factor for you um, and your dog. So going ahead and doing, whether you're doing show stuff, whether you're doing other hunting um, testing, there's other competitions like chucker challenges and things like that that you can do with your dog. You can even do dock diving, agility, um, canine good citizen. I mean, you can do it all. And it's things that will continue to challenge your dog um, that you can enjoy participating in with them. Um, So I definitely think that if you want to, you know, Pursue that. Pursue that, and it's your hobby, then by all means. Now, if you're not planning on breeding them and you're looking at this more of like, well, doing all those things would truly be kind of a chore, and I don't think I would enjoy it, or, you know, that the expense doesn't outweigh, you know, the benefit for us, then there's no need to pursue that either. So it's it's just what's right for you. Yeah, the other side that I would say is um, it – it's a mind block for me if you were to say, I want to send my dog off to be trained to be a dual champion or to run knob events or to do all of those things. Um, you know, if it's, uh, it's one thing if, you know, your goal is I need the titles, I don't have the time to do it, and the titles are going to help From a breeding stuff. perspective yeah, and a pedigree. Yeah. The, the other side of it is, again, it comes down to, Spend your money however the heck you want. But um, if you called me and said, I want my dog to be a master hunter, a utility prize dog, and we don't really have any true end goals with that, I would say, why don't we save the time and money of the travel and testing and we just train to that level and you have a really nice dog. Um, Especially if you were planning on having us 
handle. You know, if it was something that you wanted help with that training and then you could go handle and do some of that mm-hmm. yourself to Need enjoy to that process. Jump um, in the right direction. Yeah, definitely. So if it's, it's for you and what you enjoy, um, then sure. And I want to just also throw in there, um, make sure that you're not burning your dog out. That would be the only other thing. So Good if one, you're training for all these games and all these things and your dog is getting sour to it and is like, this kind of sucks. Like, I don't really enjoy this anymore. Then let's reevaluate and be like, why are we even doing this anymore? Um, you know, we want our dogs to enjoy it um, and love what they're doing. And if it becomes too much of a job and too much of a chore and there's really no benefit, then I don't think we need to do it either. Excellent. Great question. Um, and thank you for the super chat, by the way. We appreciate it. Adam Martinez, what can my wife's Frenchie train for? Hmm. Uh, hmm. hmm. Uh, anything. Literally anything. Okay. Duck dog. Uh, it's whatever. Try it. We've seen <laughs> pit bulls. Or, I know. Yeah. I, I was kind of being facetious, but. Yeah. Um, you know, dogs are in general, um, all derived from working breeds at some point in time. I mean, that's what they were designed for originally. There's very few designer breeds that existed back in the day just for the sake of being cute. They all had a purpose. So um, deep down inside, most dogs still to this day are going to function more um, mentally healthy the off of having structure and a purpose it was like a horrible sentence but i knew what you meant they're going to be happier they're going to have a more fulfilled life and it is very important for their mind to settle we see and hear all the time my dog has separation anxiety my dog has anxiety my dog has these things okay my dog chews up every shoe in the house my dog d- digs up a million holes in the backyard eats the sprinklers chases the you know reflections off the wall because those dogs are looking for a task they're looking for a job mm-hmm. and every dog is different uh, their needs are different um, their exercise requirements are different what they need to feel fulfilled is different Yep, talked to a, a patron just the other day. We set up, we've got an, a tier where you can do phone calls. So you can just um, call up, ask us a bunch of questions and not feel bad about it. Um, the, I mean, but seriously, so some folks are like, I'm sorry, I'm taking up so much of your time. Well, we do have this set up for that. So anyhow, I'm on the phone with this gentleman. He said um, that he is struggling with some stuff and it was around anxiety, specifically exactly what I was talking about. I said, well, and I find that short hairs, um, you know, have that pretty regular. Well, what short hairs have is a desire to work. Um, and with that desire to work, if it is not fed properly, it gets angry, right? It looks for some way to reach fulfillment. So they look for a job themselves. And that job could just be worrying about what is happening. Like their mental state is not good. And the way that we can get to a proper mental state is through training. We give them true uh, purpose and we help provide tasks that they can work through to challenge their brain. And then on top of that, not to be ignored, but not to be marked as the top tier here, They need physical exercise as well. So we have mental exercise and we have physical exercise. I would say that they are fairly equal, if not the the scale tipped in the direction of mental exercise. Dogs that's minds are left to wander will just turn to... Destruction, typically. Destruction, Uh, whether that's self-destruction, whether that's your stuff destruction, it's a bad deal. So... Um, your Frenchies, your wife's Frenchie, excuse me, falls into that category. You need to be training every day, a couple times a day. Meals are a great way to do that. Um, and the same thing falls, yeah, the same thing falls into the situation of, uh, they need to work for that meal. Nothing should be given free. It's, it's a, it's an important mindset for dogs to help that mental state of health, I believe that dogs should work somehow for their meals. So um, start by training, just like we would teach any puppy. 
clicker training, food rewards. If the Frenchie is not excited about working, I don't know the state in which your Frenchie is, age, weight, current exercise level, any of those things. Previous but, training experience. But start with that meal, start with that work. If we have no desire for the food or the training session, it's gone. You don't want to work. You don't need to eat. Then, and it sounds it horrible, sounds like but tough it's like, love. It, it, that's what it is, okay? And it's going to only take a few days. A dog will not starve themselves. I promise you this, okay? Just and like my children. Yes. It's the same, same thing. Um, that meal is gone. Then Dinner we bring tastes in. way better as breakfast when you're hungry. Yeah, or lunch. Lunch, Ooh, sometimes. It's happened, folks. Um, Aiden so, can be stubborn. Well, yeah. I wonder where he gets that from. <laughs> Me, probably. So, Me? Yeah, double, double whammy. whammy. <laughs> yeah, we got the we throw in it from both sides. Anyhow, needs to train. Okay, if you are training, training that brain, working for those meals, it's going to take a few days, and you'll be focused and excited. And when you have that, then you're going to be happier, and that's going to I mean, teach anything: tricks, party tricks obedience things, concentrate on proper healing behavior, then you can incorporate walks, all of it, okay? All of it, folks. That Frenchie can learn anything and everything. What do we got next? Kelly has another super chat. Whoop, whoop. 17-month GSP Jackson, collar condition to heal, yeah. no eye contact on heel, nose usually down. What's the fix? Tips on swinging into a heel. Mm. So, nose on the ground, not focused, is not truly healing. No. He's just kind of in position. Which is a typical thing for uh, the average versatile dog, and short hair specifically. I mean, these dogs are bred to be independent. They are. They are cooperative. They're supposed to be. I mean, the perfect combination would be cooperation, right? Willing to work with us, but nonetheless, independence. Because if you are just underfoot, you are not doing your job for what a short hair is typically bred for. So... It's there. Now, um, like Kat was saying, go ahead, you. So I always say sniffing isn't healing. So nose down means he's focused on other things. And if you would change direction, he's most likely not going to be paying enough attention to notice and to follow your direction. So making corrections when he is not truly healing. So his nose goes to the ground. He's not um, focused. He's looking around. That's when you would make corrections, nick, nick, nick with the collar, if he truly is collar conditioned. Um, I sometimes, too, in those situations, even if a dog's, you know, starting that collar conditioning process and pretty good, and I'm still proofing it, some of those dogs, it seems like you just clip them to a lead, but you handle with the collar. It just gives them that little tether that they can focus better. And little steps like that that can help you bridge that gap is something that I would recommend. Um, treats. Also, we have a couple videos um, that Ethan did on some engagement drills with Thunder uh, of working on some um, pivoting, swing into a heel, pivot, swing into a heel, and incorporating, especially with food-motivated dogs, yes. that treat training. That dog is going to be more willing to give you that focus and attention and anything that's the dog's idea that we are, you know, marking and we are conditioning is going to just be that much stronger. So if he helps, um, or if you help him condition those things via, you know, him wanting to and getting those food rewards, um, that focus attention that he's offering up is going to come more naturally and be a stronger, um, behavior that he's going to be exhibiting more consistently. 100%. That's the, that's going to be the ticket. Positive reinforcement to teach better behavior, um, better eye contact, all of those things. But no, it's not that abnormal what you're dealing with. So what was it? I scrolled to the next one. I scrolled to the next one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next one is from Melanie Carlson. It looks like the Super Jack came through and we're we're looking for the question. There we go. Uh, Just got back from South Dakota with Poodle Pointer and GSP. Lots of birds in the heavy cattails. Watched 50 birds go in and only 10 out. Someone said, you need a lab to push them out. Thoughts? Um, Poodle Pointers are kind of rare. I like the breed, though. Oh, sorry. That was another comment. I don't know. My brain just kept reading. Okay. So (laughs) I, for one, have a lot of experience. Um, specifically cattails in South Dakota, cattails in South Dakota and North Dakota for that matter. I mean, but, um, 10 years of commercial hunting 
which involves harvesting anywhere between six and seven hundred roosters a year, respectively. Um, uh, minus this year, lots of birds this year, drastically less roosters than what we're used to. I mean, we just saw hen after hen after hen after hen. So hopefully that means really good things for next year's hatch. But all of that being said, we do all of the hunting, all of it with short hairs. Now, um, is the potential of a flushing dog going to be maybe more beneficial in those? Sure. But it's not that abnormal any way you look at it to push 50 birds into a hole and then a bunch of them disappear. Even if you have labs. It, with any dogs. Yeah. I mean, long story short, it's, especially it's that's because, not abnormal. Um, especially because we were working some um, draw uh, draws with, you know, Waterways. wide. Yeah, wide cattail strips um, that like your eyes were just getting filled with the fluff. It was, it was kind of actually brutal. Um, and we had, oh gosh, one, two, we had like six short hairs kind of across there. And oh, yeah. the birds feel the pressure from that, whether the dogs are actively attempting to flush them or not. Yeah. And they're either going to get up or allow themselves to be pointed and then have an opportunity to get up or they're smart and wily and sneaky and they hunker down and, sneak behind you and then you could <laughs> find birds either getting up behind you or have run the other way and then sometimes you work that same strip back the other direction because that's where you parked Pick and you find yeah yep find a few more that you missed the first time and it can most likely be inferred that you also missed some going back the same direction and um, they just kind of outsmart you and that's why there's birds left to hunt next year that would probably be one of the most common questions that I get from folks um We'll walk through a shelter belt or a food plot or a grass strip or whatever. Like, how, how many birds do you think we walked over? Like, I don't know. Not very many. I trust the dogs and also don't care. I mean, <laughs> when, it, when it comes down to it, we saw a lot in front of us. What does it matter how many we walk past? Now, granted, it's not like I'm going to walk past hundreds of birds. As long as we're actively still productive in what we're doing, I'm not going to worry about it. Because as soon as you get hung up on that. Especially uh, because it's a what if, would have, should have, could have. You can't put a number on that. It's, no. It, it would just be, you know. Part of my. Pulling something out of thin air. Yeah. Part of my morning safety talk and pep talk with folks is um, we need to walk at a reasonable pace to maintain and, and maintain proper distances and lines and safety and all of those things and understand the fact that these are wild birds and we have no control over them. There, there are going to be some birds that blow out ahead of us too far. There are going to be some birds that sneak and blow out the back. Uh, if we killed them all, there would be nothing left for seed, right? Nothing left to continue the, the reproducing process. So it's better if we walk through do a decent job, and leave the rest of them, whether that's one or two or ten or, or whatever it may be, okay? So um, don't get hung up on that. Walk at a reasonable pace. Let the dogs do their thing. As they gain experience, they're going to do a better job for you, but ultimately, just have fun. We had some great super chat questions. Oh, 100%. All right, let's see, unless there's another super chat. I don't I see do one. I not see another Let's see chat. what else we can find in here. This is where it gets fun, folks. We're going to try and read. <laughs> it's nice because those, super chat, ones, yeah, those they, super chat ones are in bigger. bright green. You were like, oh, there's one to read. Otherwise, yeah. it's just trying to sneak back through here. And there's a lot of comments that aren't necessarily questions either, so it ends up being harder to to filter through. While you're looking through there, I want to mention something that's pretty cool. I've got a little hunt lined up um, going out with a, a buddy here on Friday morning. We're going to hunt some Kansas stuff. And I don't know if you guys use this or not, um, but I have found uh, Onyx Maps here is a really, really powerful tool for us planning this stuff out. We can mark all of the things like here. I'll show you. This is my, that's my local, come on. It never focuses. Mm, no, it doesn't. I don't know why it's like not 
I know it's picking up our face, but usually if you push it up there in front of everything, you can kind of see. I don't have a real good way to throw this up there. Let me try one more time here. <laughs> You're going to knock off your, your water trying to do that. There it goes. Oh, there, it went. It went. So that's my local, and I'm happy to share. Any Ask, okay? Anybody that has ever asked, I, I usually can't get you permission. I don't have, I, I don't get blanket permission on much property. Um, I try and be a little more respectful of that, knowing it's not mine, right? And I'll ask, can I come hunt this day or a couple days or this weekend or whatever it may be? So I have some places marked on here, but I don't have blanket permission on private property because I don't ask for it. Um, but... All of that being said, all those little dots are different places that are either walk-in hunting or some of the private that I know I can make a phone call and try. Um, But I use this all the time to mark all of these. It shows you exactly where you're at as well as when you click on it. It's like plots maps. Is is that a – is plots maps? Is that just a – no, plots – it's public land open to sportsmen. That's a North Dakota thing, right? I know that it is in North Dakota. I don't know about okay. other places. Well, basically what I'm saying, and I'm not using the words right, when you click on each one of these little tracts of land, it shows you who pays the taxes, which at least gets you closer to knowing who you need to contact. So that's kind of a cool feature, as well as you can see, you know, oh, wow, there's a little waterway in this one. Um, or yeah, that's usually got grass and then it looks like this is tillable acres. And then there's this little pocket clear in the back that we can go hunt that you can't see from the road. So I use that. I've got my hunt planned out. We're going to be out in the Stafford area. Somebody was asking here recently. They were like, Hey, we want to come hunt around you. If you've got time to hunt and whatever, I'm like, definitely ask. Okay. Don't hesitate to ask. Um, I, would love to hunt with you. I don't necessarily know if I will have time to hunt with you based on the window of when you're coming and what we have with work and everything else, but definitely ask. So um, this would be between Stafford and Sterling. We've got a couple spots, a little uh, pivot that's a good spot, and then a new piece that is based around a waterway. It's a really cool property. So I use it all the time to be able to see where we're hunting and what we're doing. And I'm going to do my best to try and shoot some form of video content and or pictures for sure in the aftermath if we get anything killed. Um, And it's been something that people have been asking for for a while about cooking stuff. So we will we'll come up with some cooking videos. I'm not a, a major chef or anything like that, but I know how to make wild game taste pretty good sometimes. So what'd you find? Um, somebody, uh, Cruz Lopez said, do y'all find bismuth to be more effective than steel shot? Absolutely. 100%. Comes down to density of the shot itself. So bismuth being just below lead. Um, and you got to think about the size of the shot doesn't change, right? If you have a four is a four is a four or six, 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 whatever. But when you move into the density aspect of things, it has more knockdown power. So it's not, um, and bismuth or, um, you know, there are some others. Tungsten is another one that falls into the non-toxic category. And tungsten is actually more dense than lead. So tungsten loads are like, I think there's a new thing. It's tungsten SST maybe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Throw a... um, Throw a comment in there if you know what I'm talking about, but I think it's tungsten SST, and it's like plated tungsten or some insanity, and I mean, there's some horror stories of how dangerous it actually is because of the fact that people are used to shooting shotguns, and the carry from that load is so much farther that, you know, it almost falls, and, and it doesn't fall into this category. It's more in the direction of knowing, um, 
where What's a rifle. You? Yeah, it, well, that's important, but I mean, it's like behind rifle aspects yeah. of stuff, right? It's going to carry. It's going to potentially do damage at drastically farther distances. But when we, I primarily hunt with a twenty gauge, and we actually have twenty gauge tungsten loads. So um, Kent Ammunition um, shoots. They make they make tungsten. They make bismuth. Um, they make lead. And then steel shot. Their uh, fast steel is pretty good stuff, pretty reasonably priced as well. When you get into any of the non-toxic um, steel alternatives, they get pricey, all right? So you're talking, I don't know, I've seen like 30 to $50 a box, which is a lot, right? But um we shoot some we shoot some tungsten at bigger geese and things like that it's it's definitely in my opinion falls into the category of sportsmanship okay i'm drastically more likely to kill the bird than wound the bird shooting the more lethal round through my shotgun so um, and then while we're on the subject just a little bit cuz people ask sometimes what do we shoot on a regular basis uh, I primarily shoot fast lead and uh, is it VOT, not SST. I was making just making up regular just making Acronyms. stuff, making up letters. Just throw it out there. Oh, oh it's well. the the yeah the TTQ rounds of the stuff off the six two five category. Um, anyhow, fast lead. Uh, my pheasant loads that I'm shooting. Three inch, twenty gauge, number sixes. Okay, you know, and then earlier season stuff. I typically shoot two and three quarter inch fives when possible. But that's what I got. Okay, we got another super chat. Excellent. Let's roll from it. Angelo Iacomini. I need to ask you how you pronounce your last name for sure. But how do you handle retrieving on a driven hunt? Ooh, I love that. Have you ever gotten to experience that firsthand? I've done a European hunt, but Where'd I you don't do think that at Greystone. Really, I was helping guide. I was running crews. Yeah, so this is the same concept. Now, um, driven hunts can be similar. It, it's it depends. So there's so many different setups for them, but the European is very a similar. Tower shoot, I guess. Yeah, so there's tower shoots, and then everybody has different stuff. There's also Technically, quote unquote, driven shoots would be where most of them get pushed from a higher um, elevation down and they're all kind of in the same general area. Um, so all of the setups are a little different, but nonetheless, Do I'm you guessing have, you're in a station. Have station? That's yeah. what I was just going to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm guessing you have stations. If you have stations, um, we do our best to keep the dogs steady, allow them to mark, send them for retrieves. If you don't have stations, explain to me a little bit more about what your setup is, and we can talk about that. Because for the Euro hunt, there was, you know, all these stations, kind of like a pie shape or mm -hmm. clock shape around the tower, the central tower, and then the guide that was with each hunter, basically you took that wedge, and if the bird landed and was shot in that section that was yours, that's whose dog got to make the retrieve. Absolutely. Um, but that's all I know. You know a lot. And then at the mid-break period, you get to drink Bullshot, um, which is a Worcestershire-based uh, vodka drink. With broth, too, right? Yeah, beef broth, Worcestershire, Tabasco, and vodka. Vodka. Yeah. And it's hot. Great. Warm. And it's like warm, yes. Warmed up. Great thing to mix. Let's have some uh, vodka shots in between rounds of shooting pheasants. But... That's the traditional European way, I believe. I don't know, but I'm just talking a little bit. But <laughs> we did the we did alcohol free bull shot at uh, which is basically just warm beef broth, Worcestershire sauce, Tabasco, and some other seasonings get mixed in with that. But it, it's tasty. It's like soup. It is. It's kind of like a beef broth soup, and it's different, but Throw still a few noodles, some vegetables in there, and you got <laughs> vegetable beef soup. With a kick. Pea soup. Come on, you know that movie. Ick. Adventures Down Under. Well, I was kind of asking people, but oh. sure, yeah. Adventures Down Under. Excellent one, babe. 
I um, win. Did you find another question mixed um, in? I did find some more questions mixed up in there. I didn't know if Angelo was going to have a few more details for us. Grab it, and we'll, we'll come back okay. and look. Do, 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 do. It was something about Skylar Blair. It was was saying something. Five-month-old puppy has had positive pigeons, and but won't get off the path when hunting. I'm trying to mm. find it. I, I'm paraphrasing because I can't find the question again. There it is. I have a five-month-old puppy. Introduced yep. to pigeons. Doesn't actually hunt, cover, walks the easiest path. Tips. Hey, this pretty, is good. Pretty good you, paraphrasing. You nailed it. Um, do you want to take this one or do you want to? I'll take it. All right. You got um, it. So that's great that you've done an introduction to pigeons, but sometimes those puppies need the socialization and confidence to break into that thicker cover. That's an important part of learning to hunt. Um, a couple tips is... Ah, get different. He was talking different. Okay. Get in the cover with your puppy. So if you're walking the path, they're going to want to walk the path. They're like, yeah, mom and dad are doing that. That's easy. Um, same with concept for when we've got people that are like I can't get my puppy to break over and start swimming I'm like well are you standing on the bank or are you in the water with your puppy because they're gonna have more confidence to follow their pack leader into the water same concept they're gonna have more confidence to follow their pack leader into that thicker cover um, as well as showing them and teaching them their purpose so um Doing a pigeon introduction, bird introduction, that's great, but having an opportunity for them to actually search cover and find birds and go, oh, that's what I'm doing out here. If I get in this cover and work hard, that's where the birds will be, and that's great, that's exciting, that's what I want. So a little more training as well as some guidance um, and pack leadership by you are a couple of tips that I could give to you right now. What was the rest of it? Oh, okay. So it says here, um, hunters drive from left to right, putting birds up, um, essentially marching through the field, army style, right? So this is this is a great question. And folks, um, we are we're gonna answer this one, and that's gonna be the time that we have for this evening. But um, the the driven shoot that's gonna be more typical of the way that we typically are hunting South Dakota. We're walking in a line. We're pushing birds up. We got dogs running around. Now this is a big sometimes one. there'll be blockers at the end. Yep, uh, this is a big one though. Okay, lots of people get hung up about this. This is my dog needs to hunt in front of me and brr. now there is some um, some right to that and there's some wrong to that. Okay, now one of which right to that means if the dog is close to you, there are two major things that. Um, affect the dog's ability to listen and understand what you're asking. One is time, um, and two is distance. In this specific ca case, we're talking more about distance, okay? So distance-wise, the closer the dog is to you, the better that they're going to respond to what you're asking. They can hear you. They know what's going on. You can see what's happening. You can help, um, especially manage a younger dog. But ultimately... Um, the dog doesn't need to stay directly in front of you. And I, being a guide, I utilize the dogs to, um, sorry, um, I utilize the dogs to hunt the whole line and they work everywhere and they kind of cover as much as is possible. Now, um, all of that being said, when it comes down to a retrieve, I want all of the dogs there. Dog sees it go down. Everybody can run all over there. All hands on deck. Yep. And then once one dog has the actual bird in mouth, then we call everybody else off. Hey, you got beat. Leave it be. We don't need to fight over this crap. We don't need to cause any problems. But you got beat. Leave it be. The more dogs, the more noses on the ground working to recover that bird, though, the greater the chance that bird is actually going to get recovered yeah. um, and not sneak out. So I hope that answers your question. I hope that helps. Uh, folks, as always, we appreciate the time you spend with us here on Yawa. We look forward to it every week. We love answering the questions. We love chit-chatting with you, and we're going to continue to try and help this grow. I'm sure that we'll have, um, we'll stay on a, a pretty consistent weekly basis, trying to keep those updated. Uh, you can always check the playlist when we start stacking them in there as far as scheduled events, and then when we get around holidays, we'll skip a week or so while people are traveling and doing everything else. Um, but all of that being said, again, thank you to our patrons. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. And for everyone that is here, uh, we're out of time for this evening. I'm out of water. <laughs> I wanted to do that.
<laughs> and I'm Cat the Dog Drainer. We'll I'm see the you the in guy. the next video. All right. Peace.